recovery. DataWorks Summit Europe 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Germany at Munich for DataWorks Summit 2017, formerly Hadoop Summit. I'm John Furrier. My co-host Dave Vellante, our next guest is Mike Merritt Holmes, is the Senior Vice President of Global Services Strategy at Think Big, a Terra Data company, formerly the co-founder of the Big Data Partnership, merged in with those Think Big and Terra Data. Mike, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. Great to have an entrepreneur on you, the co-founder, which means you got that entrepreneurial blood. Um, and and you, I got to ask you, you know, obviously you're in the big data space. You got to be pretty pumped by all the hype right now around AI, because that certainly gives a lot of an extra, extra steroid of recognition. People love AI. And uh, it's, it's just, uh, it gives a face to it, and certainly IoT is booming as well, Internet of Things, but big data is cruising along. Uh, I mean, it's a great place to be. I mean, uh, the the train is certainly going very, very quickly right now. But uh, but uh, you know, the, the thing for us is we've been doing data science and AI and trying to build business outcomes and value for businesses for a long time. Uh, it's just great now to see this really the, the data science and AI buzzword really starting to take effect, and so companies are starting to understand it and really starting to really want to embrace it, which is amazing. It's inspirational too. I mean, I have a, a bunch of kids in my family. Some are in college and, and some are in high school. Even the younger generation are getting jazzed up on just software, right? But the big data stuff's been cruising along now. I mean, it's been good t a decade now of really solid DevOps culture, cloud now accelerating. But now the customers are forcing the vendors to be very deliberate in delivering great product because the demand <laughs> for you know, real time, the demand for uh, more stuff is yeah. at a all time high. Can you elaborate your thoughts on your reaction to what customers are doing? Because they're the ones driving everyone not to create friction, create simplicity. Yeah, and I, you know, our customers are, you know, global organizations trying to leverage this kind of technology, um, and they are, you know, doing an awesome amount of, uh, of, of stuff right now to try to move them from, uh, from a, effectively a step change in their business. Uh, whether it's kind of uh, shipping companies doing pre uh, pre um, preventive asset maintenance, or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, retailers looking to uh, target customers in a more personalized way, or really understand <coughs> who their customers are, where they come from, they're leveraging all those technologies, and really what they're doing is pushing the boundaries of all of them, and putting more demands on, on, on all the vendors in the space to say, we want to do this quicker, faster, but more yeah. easily as well. And the things that you're talking <coughs> about, I want to get your thoughts on, because this is the conversation that you're having with customers. I want to extract is the, have those kind of data-driven mindset questions have come out of the hype of the Hadoop. So I mean, we've been in a hype cycle for a while, but now it's back to reality. Where are we with the customer conversations? And from your standpoint, what are they working on? I mean, is it mostly IT conversation? Is it a front office conversation? Is it a blend of both? Because you know, you got data science kind of threads both sides of the fence there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly you, you, you can't do you can't do big data without IT being involved, but for it since the start, I mean, we've been always engaged with the business. It's always been about business outcome because you bring data into a platform, you provide all this data science capability, but unless you actually find uh, ROI from that, then, then there's no point because you want to be moving a business forward. So, so it's always been about business engagement, but part of that has always been also about helping them to change their mindset. I don't want to report, I want to, understand why you look at that report and what's the thing you're looking for so we can start to identify that for you quicker. What's the coolest conversation you've been in over the past year? Uh, I mean, I, I can't go into too much details, but I've had some, you know, it's in some amazing conversations with, with, with companies like Lego, for instance, you know, just they're, they're an awesome company to work with. Uh, but, uh, but, but when you start to see some of the things we're doing, we're doing some amazing like object recognition with deep learning in Japan, we're doing some fraud analytics in the Nordics with deep learning, we're doing some amazing stuff that's really pushing the boundaries. And when you start to put those deep learning aspects into, into real world applications, and you start to see customers clambering over to, to want to be part of that. It's that's a really a, exciting so place to be. Let me just double click on that for a second because a lot of the question I get a lot on the cube and certainly off camera is, I want to do deep learning. I want to do AI. I, I love machine learning. I hear all, it's kind of coming to reality. So people see it forming. How do they get started? What are some of the best practices of getting involved in deep learning? Is it 
using open source obviously is one avenue, but what, what, what advice would you give customers? Uh, from, a, from a deep learning perspective, so I think first of all, I mean, um, you know, a lot of the greatest deep learning technologies are in open source, as you rightly said, um, but I think actually, um, there's, there's a lot of uh, tutorials and stuff on there, but really what you need is someone who's done it before, who knows where the pitfalls are, but also know when to use the right technology at the right time. Um, and, and also to know uh, around some of the aspects about whether using a deep learning methodology is going to be the right approach for your business problem. Because a lot of companies are like, we want to use this deep learning thing, it's amazing. But actually it's not appropriate necessarily for the yeah. use case you're trying to drive. It's a classic holy grail, just, yeah, yeah, where yeah. is it? You know, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's hard to know when to apply it. Uh, and also, you've got to have enough data to, you, to utilize those methods as well. So. You, hear, you hear a lot about the technical complexity associated with you know, Hadoop specifically, but just all big data generally. I wonder if you could address that in terms of what you're seeing, how people are dealing with that te technical complexity, but what other headwinds are there in terms of adopting these new capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, one of the challenges that we, we still see um, is that customers are struggling to, to leverage value from their platform, and normally that's because of the technical complexities. So we, re, uh, we, we introduced to the open source world last month, uh, Kylo, uh, something you can download uh, free of charge, it's completely open source on the Apache, on the Apache uh, license, uh, and that really was about uh, making it easier for customers to start to leverage the data on the platform, to self-serve ingestion onto that and for data scientists to wrangle the data better. So, so I think there's a real push right now about uh, that next level up, if you like, in the technology stack to start to enable um, non-technical users to start to do interesting things on the platform directly rather than asking someone to do it for them. Um, and, that, and that, you know, we've had technologies in the BI space like Tableau and, and obviously the, the, the best of breed data, data warehouse solutions like Teradata that have been giving customers something uh, before uh, and previously, but actually now they're asking for more. Not yeah. just that, but more yeah. as well. And, and that's where we're starting to see the, the, the increases. So that's sort of operationalizing analytics as an, as an example. What are some of the business complexities and challenges of, of actually doing that? Uh, that's a very good question because um, I think when you, when you find out great insight and you go, wow, you've, you've, you've built this algorithm, I've seen things I've never seen before, then the business wants to have that always on. They want to know that it's that, that, that insight all the time. Is it changing? Is it going up? Is it going down? Do I need to change my business decisions? And doing that and making, and making that operational means not only just deploying it, but also monitoring those models, being able to keep them up to date regularly, understanding whether those things are still accurate or not. Because you don't want to be making business decisions on, on, on algorithms that are now a bit stale. So actually operationalizing it is about building out an entire capability that's keeping these things uh, accurate online, and therefore there's a, there's a there's still a bit of work to do. I think um, actually in the marketplace still around building out an operational uh, capability. So you kind of got bottom up, top down. Bottom up is the you know the Hadoop experiments, and then top down is you know CXO saying we need to do big data. Have those two constituencies come together now? Who's driving the bus? Are they are they aligned? Is there still sort of a mess so, organizationally. Yeah, I mean, generally in the organization there's someone playing the chief data officer, whether they have that as a title or a role, um, ultimately someone is in charge of generating value from uh, the data they have in the organization. Um, but they can't do that with IT, and I think where we've seen companies struggle is where they've driven it from the bottom up. Uh, and where they've succeeded is where they drive it from the top down because, because by, by driving it from the top down you really align what you're doing with the business and strategy that you have. So the company strategy and what you're trying to achieve. Um, but ultimately they both need to meet in the middle uh, and you can't do one without and, the other. And we, we, one of our practitioner friends was describing this situation in our office in Palo Alto a couple of weeks ago. He said, you know, the challenge we have as an organization is you got the top people saying, all right, we're moving. And they start moving, the train goes, and then you got kind of middle management sort of behind them, and, and you got the, the doers that are far behind. And aligning those is, is a huge challenge for this particular yeah. organization. How do you recommend organizations to address that alignment challenge? Does Think Big have sort of 
you know, capabilities to help them through that, or is that sort of, it, you know, you got to call Accenture? <laughs> in, 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 in essence, our reason for being is to help with those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And, and you, know, whether it's, you know, whether it's right from the start, so, oh my God, my, my chief data officer is, or my CEO is saying, we need to be doing this thing right now, come on, let's get on with it. And we help them to understand what does that mean? What are the use cases? How, where's the value going to come from? What's that architecture need to look like? Or whether it's them helping them to build out capability in terms of data science, or building out the cloud cluster itself, and then managing that and providing training for staff. We, 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 a whole reason for being is supporting that transformation as a business from, from, oh my God, what do I do about this thing, to I'm fully embracing it, I know what's going on, I'm enabling my business, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm completely comfortable with that world. You know, there was a lot of talk um, three or four or five years ago about the ROI of so-called big data initiatives not being really, you know, there were edge cases, which were, you know, huge ROI, but there was a lot of talk about you know, not a lot of return. Uh, my question is, you know, has that, well first, first question, has that, has that changed? Are you starting to see much bigger, you know, phone numbers coming back where the executives are saying, yeah, let's, let's double down on this? Uh, definitely, I'm definitely seeing that. I mean, I think it's fair to say that companies are a bit nervous about reporting their ROI around this stuff but, uh, um, in, in some cases, so there's more ROI out there than, than, than you necessarily see out in the public place. But we're Why is that, because they don't want to expose to the uh, competition? Well, or yeah, I think, they don't I think want it's to like front run their earnings or whatever? They're trying to get a competitive edge. The minute <laughs> yeah. you start saying we're doing this, the, the cust the, their competitors have an, a, an opportunity to catch up. So Very so secretive. I, yeah, yeah, and I, I think uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily about what they're doing, it's about keeping the edge over their customers, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. uh, over their competitors. So, um, but what we are seeing is that many customers are getting a lot of ROI um, more recently because they're able to execute better rather than being struggling with the IT uh, problems. And, and even just recently, for instance, we had a, we had a, a, a customer of ours, the, the, the CEO uh, phone, phones us up and says, you know what, we've got this problem with our sales. We don't really know why this sales, this is going down. Uh, you know, in this country, in this part of the world is going up and this country is going down. We don't know why and that's making us very nervous. Can you come in and just, you know, get the data together, work out why it's happening so that we can, so that we can understand what it is. And we came in and within weeks we were able to give them a very good insight into exactly why that is and they changed their strategy moving forward for next year to focus on addressing that problem um, and that's really, amazing ROI for a company to be able to get that insight. Um, and now we're, we're working with them to operationalize that so that that particular insight is always available to them. And that's an example of how companies are now starting to see that ROI come through. And, and a lot of it is about being able to articulate the right business question. Um, rather than trying to worry about reports, what is the business question I'm trying to solve or answer? Mm -hmm. And that's when you can start to see the ROI come through. Can you talk about the customer orientation when they get to that insight? Because you mentioned earlier that they got used to the reports and you mentioned visualization, Tableau, they become table states. Once you get addicted to the visualization, you want to extract more insights. Yeah. So the pressure seems to be getting more insights. So two questions, process gap around um, what they need to do process-wise, and then just organizational behavior. Are they there mentally? What are some of the criteria in your mind and your experience with customers around the processes that they go through and then organizational mindset? Yeah, so I th I, what I would say is, first of all, from an organizational mindset perspective, um, it's very important to start educating not just the, the analysis team, but the entire business on what, what this whole machine learning, big data thing is all about, and, and how to ask the right questions. So, so really starting to think about the opportunities you have to, um, to move your business forward rather than what you already know, and think forward rather than retrospective. So uh, the other thing we often, we often have to teach people as well is that this isn't about what you can get from your data warehouse or replacing your data warehouse or anything like that, it's about answering the right questions with the right tools, and here's a whole set of tools that allow you to answer different questions that you couldn't before, so yeah. leverage them, and, and so that's very important, and so that mindset requires time, actually, to transform yeah. a business into that mindset, and a lot of, and a lot of um, commitment from the business so to make that happen. So mindset first, then you look at the process, then you get to the product. Yeah, and so basically, once you have that mindset, you need to set up a, an engine that's going to run and start to drive yeah. the ROI out, and that engine includes you know, your technical folk, but also your, your business users. Yeah. And that engine will then start to build up momentum, the momentum builds more interest, and over time, you start to get your entire business uh, into, into using these tools. And so it kind of makes strategic. sense, just kind of riffing in real time here. So the product gap conversation should probably come after 
you lay that out first, totally, right? Totally, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you don't choose a product before you know what you need to do with it. So, so but, but actually, often companies don't know what they need to do with it because they've got the wrong, wrong mindset in the first place. And, yeah. so, and so part of the roadmap stuff that we do, that we have a roadmap offering, is, is about changing that mindset and helping them to, to get through that first stage where yeah, they start yeah. to put the, articulate the right use cases. Uh, and, that, and that really is, uh, is, is driving a lot of value for our customers and because they start it, from the right sometimes place. Sometimes uh, you know, we hear stories like the product kind of gives them a blind spot because they tend to go into with a product mindset first. Yeah. And that kind of gives them some you know, baggage, if you will. It, it, well, yeah, because you end up with a situation where you go, um, and, and uh, you know, you, you you get a product in, and then you say, right, what can we do with it? Or in fact, what happens is the vendor yeah. will say, <laughs> these are things you could do, and they they yeah. they do give it you constrains use cases. the constraints exactly, things. Yeah, it exactly. forecloses tons of opportunity. Totally, because yeah, you're yeah. stuck within a product mindset. Yeah, exactly that, and, and you're and you're not, you know, you, you don't want to be constrained, and that's, yeah. that's why open source and and the and the kind of you know the ecosystem that we have within the big data space is so powerful because there's so many different tools for different things. Yeah. But don't choose your tool until you know what you're trying to achieve. I have yeah. a market question, and maybe you just give us your opinion, a uh, caveat if you like. It's, it's sort of a global macro view, but when we started first looking at the big data market. We noticed right away that was the, the, the dominant portion of revenue was coming from services. Yep. Hardware was commodity, so you know, sort of maybe less than you would obviously in a mainframe world, and, and open source software has a smaller contribution. So services dominated and, and frankly has continued to dominate since the early days. Do you see that changing? Um, or do you think those percentages, if you will, will stay relatively constant? Uh, well, I think it will change over time, but not in the near future, for sure. Um, you know, there's, there's too much advancement in the technology landscape for that to stop. So, um, if you had a, a set of tools that weren't really evolving, that were becoming very mature, and that's what tools you had, uh, ultimately the skill sets around them start to grow and it becomes much easier to develop stuff and, and, then, and then companies start to build out industry or solution specific stuff on top and it makes it very easy to build products. When you have an ecosystem that's evolving and growing and speed, with the speed it is, you, you're, you're constantly trying to keep up with that technology and therefore services have to play an awful big part in making sure that you are using the right technology at the right time. Um, and so for the near future, for certain, that won't change. Complexity is your friend. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we, we live in a complex world, but, but we live and breathe this stuff, so, so, to, uh, so what's complex to some is not to us, mm. uh, and that's why we add value, I guess. Mike Merritt Holmes here inside theCUBE with Teradata, Think Big. Thanks for spending the time sharing your Thank insights. Thank you for having me. Understand the organizational mindset, identify the process, then figure out the products. That's the, that's the insight here in theCUBE. More coverage of DataWorks Summit 2017 here in Germany after this short break.